On behalf of the Heritage Foundation, J.V. Venable will lead our discussion today. He is Senior Research Fellow for Defense Policy in our Center for National Defense. He is a 25-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force, served in 16 locations around the world, as well as serving in the capacities as an air controller, fighter pilot, and staff officer. He has also been a former commander of the U.S. Air Force's arterial, uh, aerial demonstration squadron, the Thunderbirds. You haven't shot anybody yet, Not right, yet. in the Thunderbirds. <laughs> Also, we are pleased to welcome our special guest, His Excellency Dr. Khalid bin Mohammed al Ataya. He started his career as a fighter pilot. While running his own law firm, he served as the president of the National Human Rights Committee from 2003 to 2008. From 2008 to 2011, he served as the Minister of State for International Cooperation, as well as serving as Acting Minister for Business and Trade. Then from 2011 to 13, he served as Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, becoming the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2013. In 2016, he was then named Minister of State for Defense, and since 2017, he has also been a Deputy Prime Minister. We are pleased to welcome His Excellency, and I turn the program over to you, JV. Thank you, John. Uh, Excellency, thank you for joining thank us you, this John. morning. And ladies and gentlemen, if I could welcome you as well. This is a great day for the Heritage Foundation. And today we're going to talk about the mill-to-mill -mill relationships between the United States and Qatar. We uh, have about 50 minutes worth of discussion. And I'm going to steal about 25 minutes of that time and uh, do a dialogue between the two of us. And then we'll open it up for questions. As John mentioned, if you have a question at any time where you have that formulated in your head, you might want to raise your hand where we can get you an index card and pass that down to the end of the aisle when you're done writing on it, and we'll make sure that those come up to the stage and we'll take them in the order that they are received. Does that sound like a fair time, fair use of our time this morning? Well, I'm looking forward to this discussion, sir. have been for several weeks. Um, as, uh, as many of you may know, uh, the general, uh, I'm sorry, the minister and I were both fighter pilots, and so when we start talking with our watches, as in shooting them off of our hands in a few minutes, uh, you'll forgive us for that. A couple of egos, but we're going to talk in a very uh, plain spoken fashion for the day about the relationship between the United States uh, and Qatar. Our, our relationship goes back to the first Desert Storm War, actually, to uh, the precursor to that, Desert Shield. Uh, where we started basing U.S. forces there, primarily uh, at the Doha International Airport in a, a little bit of an austere environment for the forces that were there. They stayed in tents by and large, but they had the use of an extraordinary airfield. Um, since that time, we have transitioned over to Al Udeed Air Base, uh, where we have a large contingent of almost 10,000 U.S. military personnel and they are working a variety of issues, and we're going to be talking about them today. I had the pleasure of serving in uh, Qatar for a year um, from 2004 and 2005. And, sir, during that time, we had an incredible runway. The operational facilities were great. Uh, and while the, the living facilities were just a little bit rustic uh, at that time, we were in trailers and, and some tents, Things have changed marketably since that time. Could you tell us about the changes that uh, your nation has, has basically made for the United States at yeah, that airport? Absolutely, Jeff. First of all, let me uh, you know, say good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm really happy to be in uh, this prestigious place talking to you, JV. Unfortunately, I left the Air Force by 2004, so we didn't have time to combat or to <laughs> <laughs> fly on each other wings. But uh, yes, when we want to talk about the, uh, uh, the, I think someone should uh, go a little bit uh, slightly back in history uh, and beyond 2000 and 2002. Uh, I was pilot then on 95, 96 when the first, uh, if you may say, the proper military to military relations started with the United States. <coughs> It's not a very pleasant story at that time, but uh, at that time in 96, we went through some uh, turmoil in the region, and uh, Qatar has uh, uh, faced, you know, an uh, attempted coup, unfortunately, at 96, by our neighbors. 
And then the United States came and stood by us at that time. And we had a military, first military present at that time, in 96, uh, from the United States, which prevents any clash with our neighbors, which we suppose all to be the allies of the United States. The, this is where the relation started between us uh, and, the, and the United States in the military uh, perspective. So in 2002, when the United States decided to, de to leave you know, the neighbor countries because you know, they couldn't take the heat, uh, Qatar did not forget the 96 uh, you know, uh, stand of the United States. With, and we say that we welcome the United States to be in Qatar. And this is regardless of what the region thinks about the presence of the American. We open our arms and, ha and hearts uh, to our colleagues and friends because we never forget what they did to us in the previous days. Yes, it was one runway at that time when you came. And you have to hold for uh, more than half an hour to find your you know, time to land. Today we have two runways in, in, in a day. And the expansion is uh, tremendous. Uh, I did this totally change. It's a, it's a full city now. And uh, we didn't stop there. We are uh, planning uh, to expand the Ladeid. Ladeid will become very soon a family-oriented place for our fellow American who lives there. Uh, we are planning for a 2040 vision uh, in a military-to-military -military cooperation with the, uh, with the United States in all aspects, whether it's in the Air Force, Navy, or the Land Force. We are improving our two uh, newly ports so we can uh, host our colleagues uh, you know, in the Navy. And the other things which we are, uh, we are doing in Radeid, which I can talk to you about in, in, a, in a specific and details while we are uh, discussing this morning. Well, fabulous, sir. The uh, access that you talked about was really remarkable from my perspective. I uh, had 95 aircraft under my command there. And when we went to um, Afghanistan, we had to fly through Pakistan. And very often, there would be a stop sign going through that where we had to wait and hold and sometimes return back to al Udeed. But the phenomenal uh, relationship that we have had with your nation meant that there was never an issue with that. Uh, unrestricted takeoff times, unrestricted landing times, unrestricted operations, and, and that was something that we grew to rely on and I think we rely on still, grateful for that. Um, the, when I was there, it was an unaccompanied uh, uh, tour. Uh, there was no facilities for um, a, a spouse or children. And I just heard you allude to that uh, in the sense that the permanent facilities that are there now are going to be expanded. Could you talk to me about how that's going to expand in order to accommodate families being at LUD? We find out that the, uh, our colleagues uh, are obliged to live outside the Al-Adid. So they choose the city of Dahu, which is too far. And, uh, uh, they don't feel comfortable being away from the base. So a uh, couple of days before I came, uh, before I come here this morning, I met with your corp of engineers in, 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 in Al-Adid, and we decided that the best way is to start immediately building a, a compound where the family can stay and uh, where they can have their own school. And, you know, as we speak today, they do have this, the, the American school, which they are enrolling on their children. But we want more of the families to be, you know, uh, stable. Yes, sir. And uh, feel uh, more, you know, more uh, uh, comfortable in their, in their state. So this is what we decided to do. We decided to start immediately of building 200 units uh, for the officers and officers' family. And uh, we are going also to increase the dorms you know, uh, to shift some of them from the old-fashioned dorms, if you still remember, to a new ones now. And all the facilities needed for that, uh, you know, to, do, to make it uh, comfortably livable. Oh, fabulous. 
Um, the city of Doha is uh, half an hour to 40 minutes away, depending on how fast you drive. And we used to drive pretty quick going back and forth. It was the security thing of the American security coming on base that uh, was the screen that basically made that into an hour, an hour and a half process. So having them on, on the uh, compound there will be a, a great add. And having that access to that incredible city and harbor will be a, another great thing for the families that get to go there. But it's not anymore half an hour now. With all the new motorways, it's been opened. This is why I urge you to come and visit us again. It's been a long time. You know, there is, uh, there is uh, motorways with all eight lines each side, so it will take you seven minutes now, maybe, if you have, if you have a Porsche. <laughs> Well, I'll uh, do my best to get over there and see it again in the near term. That would be a fabulous sight. Uh, and so um, as far as the military goes, the uh, Qatari military, you have made some big purchases in the last several years, one of which is the C-17. Uh, that airplane has great capabilities, and Qatar uh, accepted the last of them in 2015, last of eight. And so those are bedded down. Your crews have had time to get uh, familiar and acquainted and operationally ready. Uh, could you give us an idea of how you're using those aircraft, how you've used them in the past, and what you see in the future for employment? And, uh, I'll be very honest with you. Maybe the time when we decided to buy the C-17, we had a different perspective of what we're having now. At that time, we thought that, you know, we have... Uh, we are a member of the uh, coalition. We are a member of the, you know, the uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, close coalition, the GCC, and the the uh, our friend and ally with the United States. So we thought that it will help uh, to depend on uh, some time on ourselves and help our friends by our own means, and not always being dependent on the United States asset every time we have an issue. We have to call 911. So we said, let's let's do the job ourselves and help our. But uh, I find out after the 5th of June, I don't know if you're aware of this date. 5th of June for Qatar is the date of uh, where we've been ambushed by our neighbors and blockades. And, uh, you know, out of the blue, we've been, uh, uh, we lost our only, uh, you know, border with, with, the, with the Saudis, and we find out ourselves without any access uh, on the air. So the C-17s really rescued us. We had to uh, initiate an air bridge from Doha to Kuwait, to Turkey, to Morocco, to Oman, to bring all the necessary foods and medicine until we figure out how we are going to get all these flows in, you know, because it was a total embargo. And then I realized how wise our leader w was when they decided to go and buy this strategic airlift. So thank you for the, thank you for Boeing. I don't know if Boeing is here, but <laughs> I have to thank Boeing for it. Sir, uh, talk to me about the operational side of that. I completely get the domestic uh, resupply capability that it is delivered for your country. Talk to me about the military aspects of the employment of that aircraft. Yeah. We reached out to uh, our colleagues in, in Qatar, the military attaché, and, and we asked them that we really need to be involved in the operation itself. And this needs a lot of training, you know, train our crew how to enter operation and hostile areas and so on. And uh, we did this. Secretary Mattis have helped us a lot on this. and. Then we started our operation. Uh, as we speak today, we have millions of pounds being shifted with our uh, uh, you know, colleagues, the American. Uh, we fly, we just recently did our tours to uh, Afghanistan too. So it's, uh, as we speak now, our C-17 is heavily engaged with the American in the counterterrorism campaign. And uh, it's doing very, very well. So have they flown on the air tasking orders, the ATO? Uh, have they been incorporated in this? Yes, yes, of course, of course. That of is course. a huge yeah, step. Yes, and uh, yes. to be able to rely on them in that capacity, it's a huge airlift uh, capability. Absolutely. And we all Absolutely. need it. Absolutely. And um, back to the uh, American equipment, uh, I would like to touch on this so we don't. Uh, 
it's not only the C-17, actually. 20 years ago, we've been, you know, a Europe-oriented military uh, country. So all our equipment was, uh, uh, you know, from Europe mostly. Uh, today, most of our backbone system are from the United States. For example, we had uh, the C-17, as, as you mentioned. We managed to get approval, and now it is under process, the early warning radar, which is one of the, one of the things which we will heavily depend on uh, to uh, you know, have a good eyes. We have a 20, we bought the Apache from the United States, we bought the F-15, the Patriot, and uh, also some other uh, land force uh, equipment. And this needs a lot of training and doctrine changing. This is why we are, and also the jobs, not to mention the job has been created by this system. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs if we bring all the systems uh, together being created on that. And we are happy. At least we feel that we are, you know, uh, giving something to our uh, allies and, 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 and friends in the United States. But this needs a lot of training and a lot of engagement. And this is what we are trying now to accomplish together. Uh, with our colleagues here. Well, fabulous. So 24 Apaches. Um, and uh, you bought those about three to four years ago, and now you're on the... With an option to increase, huh? Yes, sir. And, now, and you're also talking about going from about 18 fighters to almost 100 between the F-15E, uh, the Typhoon, and the Raphael. Um, that's going to be a lot of pilots, a lot of air crew members, a lot of maintenance technicians that are all highly skilled, and it takes a while to develop that from the NCO core on up. So in the near term, how do you plan on filling that, uh, that manpower uh, requirement? One, uh, one Qatari is worth of a hundred. Right? <laughs> they have to. Okay. They, have, they have no choice. They have no other choice. But no, we have a good programs. We are uh, dealing hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the, the entities or our uh, counterpart from the United States, um, namely the, our military attache in Qatar. Uh, to make this program, uh, training program, smooth. We have our own Air Academy in Qatar, and they are graduating uh, good numbers. We just, uh, we just graduated 35 pilots uh, day before yesterday. Last year, we graduated 30. Next year, we estimate to graduate 60. So we have good outcome from our Air Academy. And uh, I, think, uh, I think when the systems arrive, we will have enough numbers to, to operate them, and they will all be Qataris. Uh, that's uh, an amazing feat, because the acquisition's gonna happen so fast, and then the, the manpower to come in and fly it, uh, that takes a while to develop, so good on you for, for making those steps right up front. Now, sir, we've talked about tangible aspects. We've talked about the equipment and the, and the uh, things that everybody can see, but let's take a minute or two to talk about the intangibles, the, the things that are harder for many folks to understand. I think it's probably evident to most people in the room how important uh, Al Udeed is to the United States. Uh, CENTCOM forward is there. Um, our CAOC, Combined Air Operations Center, is there, uh, as well as airlift, ISR assets, tanker assets, uh, and, and uh, fighters on occasion. Um, so it's very important, and our relationship to Qatar is very important. Would you, would you take a minute to tell uh, the audience uh, what the relationship means to the Qatari people. First of all, let me tell you the importance of Al Adid on that on that region. Uh, uh, Qatar is a is a strategic place to be. If you uh, if you can picture the uh, the geography of the region, where Afghanistan is, or where uh, Iraq is, or Syria, or the other important uh, and hot spots in the region. Uh, secondly, I'm not exaggerating if I say that 80% of the air-to-air -air refueling on the operation, the whole operation, the whole region, is done by uh, al Adid Air Base. Our fellow American who are in, 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 uh, in Qatar, they are the one who makes your birds 
keep flying. Yes, sir. I believe at least 80% of your birds. And uh, how we see it in Qatar, uh, it is very important that uh, we keep this relation going. Uh, Qatari people are very welcomed uh, people, and they are, you know, uh, uh, open. They, they like uh, the diversification. So the Americans in Qatar are uh, very uh, uh, well received. We are learning on the military side. We are learning a lot by uh, flying side by side of uh, your brave men and women in Qatar because our people is gaining a lot of experience. It is an operational environment, a real operational environment. There is no place for mistake. So everybody is doing his utmost best uh, to be up to the, to the standard which, you know, uh, we in Qatar at least want. And this is a great chance to have our colleagues with all their experience flying in, in, uh, in Qatar with us. So this is, how we, this is how we see it. I won't uh, touch the political aspect of it. I would like to keep it on the military to military and how we as a military look at it. Fabulous, sir. I, I don't know how people uh, in the audience view our relationship, but having been on the ground, uh, one of the nicest Christmas Eves I've spent in my life was at a Starbucks in uh, Doha. And uh, the people were incredibly uh, um, em embracing of the, the moment. And uh, the most uh, beautiful Christmas music that you've ever heard was uh, coming out of the loudspeakers. And there were only four Americans that were there uh, in the... The rest uh, is Qataris. <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly right. So incredible. And I actually have a, a, a Starbucks coffee cup that I carry around with me from that moment. And uh, it's just a, a great memory. Uh, just a little bit of a, of a shift. Uh, you know, um, the strategic, the geostrategic plat platform and plateau and the things that we're experiencing in the world, they're shifting like titanic plates. You never know what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years, but let's take the ideal. In your mind, if everything went well uh, in, in your position, where would your alliances be in the next 10 years? In the year 2028, where would your alliances uh, be? Well, uh, to answer this question, I have to shift a little bit away from the military to military relation to just to draw the the picture uh, our uh, strategic ally uh, no doubt not because i am here but it is the the united states and qatar and, uh, when i say 2040 vision because we have a plan for the 2040 vision in the military to military relation with the united states but if we see the different aspects it will give you how Thai is the relation. Today in the energy sector, for example, which is our bread and butter, at least until now, until we reach our, you know, our 2030 vision to diversify our income. 30% of our energy, our partner is America, which is, you know, Exxon Mobil for uh, this who does not know. And this is the number one uh, gas exporter field on the world. And our partner is the, uh, the ExxonMobil. So ExxonMobil is with us forever. So it's not for the 10 years. It's for the 60, 70, 80 years. God knows when this will be depleted. Secondly, education. Most of our uh, young Qatari who are attending here are graduated from American universities. And if you know that we have a Qatar Foundation where they have the, uh, uh, you know, they have the education city. And on that education city, we have five campus of the most prestigious university in the United States. For example, we have Northwestern, Carnegie Mellon, Georgetown, and uh, Cornell University. So this prestigious university are in Qatar as a main campus, and not as under license. They are there, you know. So if you see all this, uh, you would have draw 
uh, a conclusion how is the relation is tied with the uh, with our colleagues in the united states so we have i think we have made our our mind so you know we should talk about 30 40 50 years beyond your 10 years yes sir Fabulous. Uh, well, just as a warning to you guys, I'm about running out of questions. So if you've got one of those index cards or you want one, please raise your hand. And uh, if you've got the, those questions already done, make sure they get down to the aisle to where uh, our proctor over here uh, can hand them up to me in just a minute. I can use this, yes? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So uh, if I could turn that same question 10 years from now. That's when the, the fruits of your purchases uh, for military hardware and the development of your personnel to man that, <clears throat> that hardware is going to be bearing fruit. What would the military, the Qatari military, be capable of doing operationally, and how do you see them being used in the region? As I said when I started that, at, uh, for the past uh, 15 years, since the first Gulf War started, 20 years, I believe. Uh, Qatar was heavily dependent on you guys, heavily. So every time we have an issue, as I said, we pick up the phone, call 911 and say, you know, SOS, please. So this was not very pleasant. And one day your colleagues, no matter how close to you your ally, they will feel that you are a burden in their shoulder. So we decided that we need to improve our capability and then join our friend and ally as partners and participate uh, and to defend our country and our region uh, with them rather than just uh, enjoying, you know, enjoying the, uh, the good life we have and leave this to your, uh, you know, men and women who are fighting there. So this was a very wise uh, decision by His Highness the Emir of Qatar. And this is when we started to build our capability. So this is one of the main reasons. The second main reason is I think uh, we find out that if you have muscles. It's a way of bringing stability and peace. You know, and if you are surrounded with a giant country, maybe sometime in the morning when they wake up, they don't meant to hurt you, but if they stretch, you know, they might kick you. <laughs> so you have to be ready to, <laughs> at least, you know, to be ready to protect yourself. So this is the second thing which makes us, uh, you know, enhance our capability. Wonderful. Well, do we have questions, uh, Dakota? Thank you very much, sir. Okay, uh, this question um, is from Al Jazeera TV, and it says, the, the memorandum of understanding that was signed back in July, how is it helping your fight against terror and fighting terror? Who's helping us? Sorry again. <laughs> oh, the what signed with the American? Yes. Well, first of all, let's see. This is the memorandum of understanding which we've been signed. This is the outcome of our meeting in Riyadh when President Trump visited Riyadh. And uh, I can say it uh, broadly that the only country who was serious uh, to counter terrorism after that meeting is Qatar. We are the only one who took this forward, and we signed the MOU with the United States. We have a, a joint uh, uh, task teams uh, from all the entities concerned, like the Treasury in the United States, uh, Treasury in Qatar, uh, the MOD from both sides, uh, you know, State Department. And we have did a lot of progress on that. So uh, I think we are on the right track. We have advanced a lot, and uh, this is the thing that people does not realize, that today we are living in a place where it is not the conventional enemy who are, we are fighting. It is the unconventional. And terrorists are attacking 
you know, uh, they don't uh, have a religion, they don't have time, they, you know, you never know where they come from. So uh, I think uh, this is a strategic decision Qatar has uh, made with the United States uh, to sign and go ahead with that. So I've got a question here that's obviously biased, and I'm not sure I like not it so from far. Not again. Please. No, no, no. I think, <laughs> I think this is a, a color of its own. I'll just say uh, you discussed Qatar-U.S. Um, co cooperation with Air Force and how it's developing with the Navy. How do you see cooperation developing with the U.S. Army? Oh. No, very well. In fact, uh, we are working. You know that we have uh, both the... Uh, patriots and the patriot is uh, very much linked uh, to the army and uh, they are uh, facilitating everything for us to get uh, you know uh, to get our hand and to be trained there at the same time we do have uh, uh, at Salia camp uh, the land force equipment and the uh, support uh, system so uh, relation is 360 it is a 360 degrees, but uh, maybe always the land force, they don't, they don't like to, to have the show, you know. It's only us, you know, the Air Force and the Navy who would like to be always decorated. And, and we are, I mean, let's, you know, let's, always let's not be their shy boots, about that. You know, yes, <laughs> yeah, steak night at Camp Asaleo was the best on Wednesday nights, yeah. I think it, it was. Uh, and the uh, CENTCOM forward has moved from Camp Asalea onto Al Udeed. Um, do you know why that was done? Was it mostly connectivity and comms? And better facilities too. Better facilities. We are going to expand these facilities too. As I told you, we have a big plan to uh, expand the Udeed to make it, uh, you know, to make it uh, permanent. Uh, you know. Maybe our colleague, our colleague and friend in the uh, DOD here are reluctant to mention the word permanent, but we are working from our side to make it a permanent. Fabulous. So this one I can't confirm uh, the, the question, but I'll just go ahead and ask it. Uh, there have been reports uh, recently that Qatar is planning to purchase the Russian S-400 uh, um, surface-to-air missile system. Is this true? Uh, and if it is true, why? Okay. Um, first of all, the uh, the MOD of Qatar did not announce this, and uh, uh, we in the uh, in the MOD usually uh, look at all uh, opportunity uh, around us. You are a military man, and uh, when you study a system, uh, you know uh, there is nothing about having a look to see what suits you, what suits your country. So uh, uh, I don't see any, uh, any issue of us looking around and seeing uh, other systems around. But that does not mean this is a substitute uh, to our relation with the United States. And our relation, as you know, is in air defense. It's at its peak in, in air force, land force. So. But that does not mean we cannot go and look and just see what the world has. Now the, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the S-400 has some of the longest legs of any surface-to-air <coughs> missile system in the world. It's Russian-made, and uh, it is probably the most advanced that's been fielded of any of the services or any of the, um, of the nation's uh, surface-to-air missile systems. Now, I didn't hear you confirm or deny that you were going <laughs> to do that. But uh, I heard kind of a lean into that. Is that right? So it, it might be happening? Well, we are reading. We are reading about the S-400 and how uh, scary it is. But, uh, to be honest with you, the MOD did not announce. Unless uh, Nawaf uh, announced something behind my back. Uh, <laughs> okay. That would never okay. happen here. <laughs> but, uh, no, sir. All right, so advanced technology. Do you anticipate a role for unmanned systems and other advanced technologies in Qatar's defense portfolio? Uh, perhaps uh, air and missile defense, area surveillance, or maritime operations? Unmanned systems is the question. Yes. Uh, well, we have, uh, in, the, in the MOD, we have uh, uh, three uh, roles now. 
one of them is the uh, military technology and reaching out to colleagues who have uh, uh, good technology and try to partnership with them to get the, uh, the best out of this technology. Unmanned, uh, whether it is a, you know, GUV or air uh, manned, uh, are the future, I believe. Yes, sir. Maybe if you ask me a, a direct question, I believe that the last manned airplane will be the F-35, in my opinion. Maybe post the 35 uh, will be all unmanned. So this is, I think, the right time for us to reach out and look for this technology from now and try to do some partnership. Uh, so when it comes, we are uh, at the edge. Sir, is that a, an area for U.S.-Qatari uh, 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 cooperation? Yeah, for sure. But my investment man is here, defense investment, and he always doesn't like me to speak about these things in detail. But he have a lot in his port, uh, you know, portfolio in the United States. All right. So we'll attack you later. Yes. <laughs> All right. The global economy and security interests as a leading energy exporter. You talked about this a little bit earlier. Qatar is in a position to observe regional and global economic trends. Do you see generally positive trends or dark clouds on the horizon? And what are the implications for Qatar's security interests? This is a very important question, actually. And uh, uh, what's happening in the region uh, on the past seven months, I think it's, uh, it's not very pleasant for the security of smooth flow of energy. Uh, keeping the GCC uh, in a coherent, uh, uh, coherent uh, status is very important for the safe and smooth flow of the energy. For example, uh, you know, our big neighbors are rich in oil. Uh, Qatar, uh, I can say almost every lamp here, everywhere in the world, has 30% of Qatari gas on it. So imagine that you are supplying 30% of the world needs. And with uh, people without a vision in the region, people who are, you know, acting in a, uh, I can say it uh, comfortably in a, child, uh, uh, you know, uh, mood, are jeopardizing the region for one reason. Because other countries has bad tests on the past of manipulating oil price, trying to bring them to their knees. And these countries will not allow to temper with oil and gas, because they only have oil and gas. So when they feel that you are going to threat their gas, you are giving them a free ticket to come to the region. And this is very dangerous. You know, so uh, this is why uh, we always try to encourage our colleagues here that I think enough is enough. And uh, people who are uh, acting, uh, you know, uh, childishly should stop and bring this to an end. Mr. Uh, this is a follow-up question to the S-400 question earlier. What is Qatar's motivation for pursuing a purchase of the S-400 system, if you are? Uh, and uh, do you have any concern that it could trigger U.S. penalties? Um, I think uh, our relation with the United States is uh, much, uh, you know, much... Uh, uh, deeper than it will be affected if we buy, you know, uh, from here on there. You know, we have a rooted uh, historical, whether military to military or, you know, uh, education or energy with the United States. So I don't think uh, such a thing will affect the, the historical and solid relation with the United States. Yes, sir. So you purchased uh, Turkish armored personnel vehicles, uh, and I believe that's, that uh, purchases, basically, the acquisition is completed now. Turkey is a partner. First of all, Turkey is a NATO member. Yes, sir. So you depend on Turkey very much, and Turkey is our uh, partner. And uh, actually, we have a partnership on the facilities who we have purchased from them the, the vehicle. So we are partners, and uh, we have share on it. Well, what's our share? Fifty percent. So you know, imagine that you have a, 
uh, you have a share in a company and and you go uh, you know you, you let ford and you go and buy you know gmc and you are ford partner what will happen to you so Yes, sir. Diversifying your portfolio is a great thing. Uh, you've uh, bought the Typhoon. You're buying the uh, Eagle, uh, the, the Strike Eagle. Cream of the sky. Yes, sir. Eagle. Yes, sir. Yes. And then uh, you've got the Raphael coming in. So completely understand that. And I, quite frankly, from a U.S. perspective, we'd like nothing more than you to buy that S400 uh, just so we get to, you know, um, get up to it. You know what I'm saying? Just look at it from a, a not too far, far away distance. <laughs> Might be pretty interesting. I think having all this platform will give Qatar the, will give Qatar, you know, the security of their airspace which they needed. Yes, sir. And at the same time, as I told you, Qatar is not a, a war seeker. You know, we've been known for the past hundred years of, uh, in fact, sheltering people who are uh, live in fear. But uh, to secure our air, uh, to secure our land, to secure our sea, I think this is an element of stability. You know? Yes, sir, it absolutely is. Uh, in your 2040 plan, it appears um, it incorporates many countries throughout the world. Uh, water will be a very strategic resource uh, in the future. What are your plans going forward to ensure you have diversified sources of water for your economy. Yeah, so this is very important, especially knowing that all our neighbors now are building new clear power plants for desalination and so around the only uh, locked sea which we have. Uh, but uh, rest assured that uh, this is something which I did not ignore, nor the government of Qatar ignore. And uh, we have our strategic plan. We are implementing it. And uh, as we did when they ambushed us and embargoed us at, in the middle of night and we woke up thinking that we will not have food or medicine to our children and we did provide all this in less than 24 hours, rest assured you will get the water. Yes, sir. So we are planning. We are planning. How do you see the role of the United States in the region? And what can Qatar do to help the United States in that role? In a region in which perspective? The, the narrow perspective or the region as a whole? I think it's uh, on the whole, a regional stability. Yes. The region uh, as a whole, I believe the United States has to do more uh, in the uh, Iranian uh, issue. Uh, I think they have to push for a serious uh, dialogue, keep the dialogue going. Because God forbid anything happen other than solving the standing issue in different way, other than uh, a deep dialogue, it will be a catastrophe in the region. This is at the wider picture. At the, uh, at the smaller picture, I believe the only one who can solve the GCC issue is President Trump. I think he can solve it in a, in a phone call. I can tell you that. And this is why we always urge, uh, you know, the, uh, the White House uh, presented by uh, President Trump that everyone should, he should invite everyone for the table. And again, uh, to solve all this issue uh, over the table for one reason. Uh, nobody's benefiting from what's happening in the GCC but the terrorist group. Uh, what's going on in the GCC is disturb disturbing all the operation. I can tell you, I am there. I look after al -Hadid. I look after all this operation. And I know how this, uh, uh, this uh, chaos is disturbing uh, the uh, combating of, uh, of uh, terrorism. Yemen is another issue. We should have a solution to Yemen. Syria is another issue. I think United States you are the global power, and so you are a global reach. And it is not me who decided that you have become a global power, global reach. So you have, you have to play the global reach thing with the global power. Yes, sir. 
Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I've got uh, one or two questions here to, uh, to pelt you with, and then, uh, then we'll be on our way. Uh, you mentioned Qatar's uh, tense relations with its neighbors. How will your nation move to collaborate with key members of a uh, potential Middle Eastern uh, coalition to fight ISIS? Well, uh, as I told you, from the beginning of the GCC crisis, we've been calling for a dialogue. We are open, uh, you know, we can discuss anything. The only thing which we don't accept is, uh, you know, uh, imposing condition on us or precondition or trying to, uh, trying to tamper with the sovereignty. They're very, uh, you know, uh, tough people. So we don't accept any, you know, any precondition on us. But at the same time, very open to, uh, uh, you know, to discuss any issue which they think worries them. This is one. Two, as far as there is a dispute on that region, you cannot uh, fight terrorism the way it should be because this needs an ex exchange of information. This needs, uh, you know, uh, uh, synergy in utilizing your assets, and this is not happening. This is the only crisis uh, I knew about uh, in the whole time of a human being that a crisis has no back door or dialogue. During the Cold War, there will always be a back door to discuss with your counterpart and at least have someone smoothen things down. Uh, the things which happen in 5th of June until now is strange. You will never find this model at all, where all line of communication is broken and cut. So uh, I think it will not help in our ultimate goal, which is uh, fighting ISIS or ISIS co. It's interesting that you uh, bring up the back door for negotiations. Um, the Bush administration, uh, Bush the uh, younger administration, if I'm not mistaken, they asked you to establish that door for the United States with Hamas. So many doors, not one door. <laughs> and, uh, and that was uh, fascinating that that, uh, that remained open for so long. Uh, you've, uh, well, I've got a, a very nice remark here. It's the first one on the top of the card. It says, thank you for coming. Oh, uh, excellent. thank you very much. And if I did not extend my uh, gratitude, let me do that now. <laughs> thank you for coming. What adjustments, uh, if any, would you, would, would your nation like to see with the Iran deal? With the Iran deal? As I told you, I think with the Iran, uh, uh, there should be, a, uh, you know, there should be always uh, dialogue to solve this uh, a deal has been done the only thing is how, you know you have to uh, talk seriously about uh, implementing this deal supervising the implementation and uh, only then uh, you can uh, change things if there is uh, things which is did not been covered on that uh, on that deal uh, other than that it's not a pleasant picture. Sure. Well, I, uh, that's all the questions that we have for you uh, from the audience. Um, but is there anything that you would like to say in closing, sir? More than this, the questions? Yes, yeah, sir. That's OK. No, I'm, uh, I wanted to thank you, JV, for uh, you know, being here. This is the first time I've uh, been interviewed uh, away from uh, politics and diplomacy. It's, with, you talk to me about things which I really love, military to military relation. I wanted to thank you and thank the audience taking their time and come and, you know, to, to listen to us. Excellency, I, I will say that this has been a great honor and a privilege for the Heritage Foundation and myself. And ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in uh, giving him a round of applause? And thank you.